It is Tuesday. I can't believe it. August 24th. My goodness gracious. I'm Guy Adami. Dan Nathan is joining me. This is the macro setup. Today's macro setup is brought to you by our presenting sponsors, Nadex, the leading U.S. exchange for binary options, call spreads, and Dan, get ready for later. Knockouts, we're going to be joined by the great Chris Vecchio, senior strategist at Daily FX, and of course, our friends at Open Exchange. They manage virtual meetings that matter for the top companies around the world. I also want to welcome our Virgos out there as we are now for the horoscope fans. We are in the Virgo territory. Dan, how are you? I'm a Virgo guy, Adami. You know that I have a birthday I, that's in September. Why, that's <clears throat> why I just brought it up for you, Virgo. I, I love it that I love it that each week you're just amazed that we made it another week. Is it that that at your age you're just happy to be here again, or is it that just that in this market environment that we lived, uh, you know, a, another week here? Is that what's going on? I think I think it's the former. I think you know when you get to my age, every day you wake up is just a blessing. <laughs> yeah. So the fact that here we are on August twenty fourth. Believe it or not, the dog days of summer are actually behind us. Fall, can you hear that, Dan? Fall is just a whisper away. But you know what's a whisper away? Yeah. The all-time highs in the market, and we're going to talk about that. But the things you want to look at are top three. Delta variant discount, DVD. I just bought a few DVDs the other day. And quite frankly, the Delta variant's a big deal. As a matter of fact, Dan, I'm not talking out of school but we just learned yesterday that we are going back to doing fast money remotely, no longer be at the NASDAQ for the foreseeable future. So clearly things are going on on that front, but market clear doesn't seem to care. Jackson Hole de-risk. Well, you know what? They told you last Friday that they're going to do this virtual. We talked about it on fast money. I think that gives the Fed tremendous air cover. I'm sure you have some thoughts and this is your beauty. I know I don't understand any of this, but, a, a JPEG Apalooza. What is that? Can you help me with that one, Dan? JPEG Apalooza guy. Ah, We're going to talk ah, NFTs, ah, non fungible tokens. It's all wrapped up in the crypto craze that's going on. Well, let's go to that that um, Delta variant de risk. As far as you know, the markets being back at all time highs. If you look at some of the volatility that we've had um, in equity markets over the last couple of months, it's been clearly related to um, the Delta variant spreading back in July. What was that peak to trough decline that we had from an all time high was about three and a half percent. The one that we had, you know, over the last week or so is about two and a half percent. Those declines are getting narrower and narrower. I think the last five percent decline we had was back in March. At the time, you know, the S&P was still up solidly on the year. But this is really important, guy. The NASDAQ was not. The NASDAQ got nearly back to unchanged. It was very near its 200 day moving average. But what was going on there? We're going to hit all these charts in a little bit rates, right? Rates were at their highs for the pandemic sort of period here. What the 10 year US Treasury yield got to 1.77, 1.78 or so and high growth tech, high valuation tech did not like that. They got slammed the Palooza, if I may yeah. use it. And we're going to talk about this. I don't understand this JPEG stuff. But what I will say is, you know, Jackson Hole de risk. There's there's some talk about that. You know, maybe this Obviously, the Delta variant, although the market seems to discount it, maybe that gives the Fed some cover. Obviously, they talked about some tapering. I think the market didn't particularly like that, but I think this definitely does give them air cover to sort of back off on that if they want. There are a lot of things to like right now in terms of the market setup, despite the fact you know, that we're looking at shutdowns once again. I mean, we just talked about in terms of what it means for our show, but you can sort of map that out across the country. And we'll talk about this JPEG loser. I still don't get it. But First thing we have to look at, obviously, is the S&P 500 chart, Dan, because <clears throat> up, up, and away for you Age of Aquarius fans out there, here we are. And we are headed back to that upper end of the trend line, Dan. And it probably comes in close to a lot of what these analysts are saying now, 45, 50, 4,600 or so in the S&P 500. Obviously, the 200-day moving average is down there now at 4,025. Again, I'll say uh, for those that haven't seen the, the S&P 500, that 200 day moving average, we had about five points each day. So now we're about 4025. And that basically coincides with the lows that Dan talked about earlier in May. So We'll see. But right now, all systems are go for the S&P. Well, hold on, Guy Adami, you got to stop the presses here. I think Wells Fargo, their strategist came out with like a 48.25, not 12-month price target, 
year-end price target for the S&P 500. The SPX is just below 4,500. To your point, when I look at that chart, it's pretty, you know, it's pretty interesting. You see that 50-day moving average there in purple. That has been the support uh, on those declines there, but it just keeps holding it like a boss. You see that resistance level. Let's see what it would take to get through there. We would need to see a reacceleration in some economic data and really some clarity that the Delta variant is behind us and that school school openings are going to go very smoothly. I mean, listen, you and I have been saying this all along. We think a break of that 50 day, a break of that upward um, or that uptrend from last year's lows or last fall's lows, you don't really have support other than those kind of, you know, troughs in the, in the uptrend um, back to that 200 day moving average. That seems like a long ways away. People can't really envision a reason why that would happen. But I bring you back to the lower left of that S&P chart, what was going on last September when the S&P was down 10%. And I know that we did not have vaccines. And I know there was a lot of uncertainty about the elections, but risk happens fast, Guy Dami. No question about it. And you know, you mentioned Wells Fargo. I, th- I believe, and in, in, at me if I'm incorrect, I'm sure people will, but I think they went basically from low on the street in terms of their S&P 500 forecast to now high on the street, which is a pretty amazing. You go from low to high, but you know, good for them, I guess. And we'll see if it makes it there. Right now, it appears as though th- there's nothing stopping this S&P 500 and Jackson Hole notwithstanding. You know, I'm hard pressed to believe they're going to say anything this week that's going to derail this market. But as you say, risk does happen fast. And we've seen it before. My sense is we'll see it again. Take a look at the NASDAQ chart, because again, you've seen similar here. I mean, the peak to trough declines have been real since this time last year. You've seen a number of them, Dan. We haven't seen one now, in my opinion, a meaningful one since the spring. Maybe we're on the precipice. You mentioned the 50-day holding in the S&P. Well, guess what? It held in the NASDAQ as well. And that 200-day moving average comes in around 13,550 or thereabouts. Yeah, that breakout level guy from a few months ago, I guess it was like early June, mid June or so near 14,000. That seems like a level where, you know, before we just had this rip, um, if it had broken the 50 day, I think that would have been a pretty decent level to kind of reload. And I go back to some of the drivers, the NDX and NASDAQ 100, we know the top five names make up 45% or so of the weight. And in this rate environment, right, where even when there's taper talk um, at some point in the fall, rates are not moving. We're going to look at the 10-year U.S. Treasury yield, um, that's good for those stocks. Let's just be frank. And those are powering these uh, new highs here. It's interesting. Mel Faber was on, um, as you say, Squawk and Friends earlier this morning. And he talked about, some, you know, he actually had a different view in terms of rates and what they mean for the market. To the extent you're interested, I'd go back and listen to that interview. Wait, but- who was it? I'm, I'm, I'm curious. I, I didn't hear you. Uh, Mel Faber, I believe, is that gentleman's oh. name, if you want okay. to look it up. You're obviously not, I mean, I know you're not a big know. fan of the, yeah, yeah, anyway, go back and listen to the interview, Dan, please. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Russell's the next thing we need to look at, because this, to me, as we say all the time, the most economically sensitive names, and but basically something's been going sideways in a very defined range since January, and you, it makes you wonder, What is it going to take for us to break out either way at this point, break out to the upside or break down uh, and and test levels we really haven't seen since December of last year? Thoughts on this one, because I do have some thoughts. I think this is still the RTY is still struggling with where they want 10 year yields to be. Yeah, and not only yields, but also input costs. We know that they're economically sensitive here, pretty much domestically focused. And, and Guy, I, I don't know how we can have this conversation and not highlight the fact that we're seeing a ratcheting down of growth expectations. We're seeing weakening data. You saw that ISN um, services number um, yesterday. Um, you know, the, the data is really not supporting this full on reflation trade. And I think that's reflected in the Russell. When I go back and I look at the NASDAQ 100, that to me, is a bit more defensive despite higher valuations. I think the the ones that are driving that train, I think a lot of investors want to hide out there. In the Russell, it's a different story. You know, guy, you would have thought when we had that Pfizer, um, the FDA announcement that Pfizer finally got approval for their vaccine yesterday, we saw the markets rip. And maybe that has to do with some of the the kind of pushing out of a taper. Who knows? It seems to be week to week. Um, But, you know, you would have thought that the Russell and some of these transports would have acted better. They didn't. And that's a that you brought that up last night on Fast Money, and I agree with you. You would have thought, obviously, the one that would have led would have been the Russell. It didn't. It's interesting. We'll see. You know, I've said all along 
uh, for years now that I think the Russell, the IWM, the RTY, whatever you look at, typically leads the broader market by about a month and a half or two months. And look, it's been sideways now for effectively the last nine months, and the market's sort of been grinding higher. We'll see what happens if this breaks out one way or another. But, you know, the thing that obviously is driving this, and you mentioned it, are yields. And that's something we have to look at because here we are, you know, making this uh, right now. We're at 125, 126 in the 10 year, sort of in no man's land, in my opinion. Can't figure out really what it wants to do. You've had, you've had days where you get north of 130. Then you have subsequent days where you're down around 120. And here we are sort of going sideways yet again. I will still say that I think this heads higher in terms of yields. Uh, that one, I want to say 133 or so level is a 50-day. I think we break it. We'll see what happens if we do it yeah. in a meaningful way. Well, let, let's see. I mean, you know, again, you see that 50-day. It's about to cross um, the 200-day on the way down What do they here. call that, Dan? What they, they call, call that, that a death cross guy. And, and I'm just perplexed at how weak um, or how yields. You know, I read something this morning, David Rosenberg, who I'm a big fan of, Rosenberg Research, um, in his morning note. And I just want to read this, if you will uh, give Please. me uh, a, few, a few seconds here. And this was a portion of his morning thing called Tip of the Hat. So he goes, so let's get this straight. Straight. We had a massive commodity price surge now over. We've had a tripling in the fiscal deficit and a near doubling in the size of the Fed balance sheet. Years of zero or negative real policy rates, a global cost squeeze from disrupted supply chains, an impressive lineup, inflation, fear mongers led by Larry Summers, episodes of dollar weakness, cries of labor shortages and explosion of wages. The best economy supposedly since the onset of the Reagan go-go era of the 80s. You remember those yet and yet the 10-year tips break even level sits below 2.3 percent where they have been for more than three quarters of the time since inception in 2003 this is where we are in july 2008 just as we were going into a new chapter of the housing crisis and financial sector meltdown we haven't seen these inflation why haven't these inflation expectations broken out I, all right i'll stop there i'm just saying he makes a lot of great points if everyone's screaming about it, why haven't we seen this in, in inflation adjusted rate? I mean, to me, it doesn't yeah. make any sense. Well, I mean, it's a global, I know you know this. I mean, he makes great points, but it's also a relative value thing with global yields just getting compressed by whatever factors are at work. I mean, 10 year yields become very attractive. So it's just, you know, I happen to, again, I think they're artificially low um, for a number of different reasons. And we'll see. I think if the market were left to its own devices, 10-year yields will be significantly higher. But, you know, trade the market you have, not the one you want. And I say this as well, price is truth. And right now, I mean, he makes points that I really can't push back against. And I think, you know, you sort of put an exclamation point on that. That's well done by you. Um, but again, I will continue to say inflation is here on in a, you know, Brian Kelly talked about it last night. It's not necessarily inflation, but stagflation. That, quite frankly, is something that the Fed has no arrows in their quiver uh, to combat. We'll see. But which leads us, obviously, to the next thing we want to talk about, Dan, and that's the dollar, because the dollar drives everything. The dollar's had a bit of a rally. Uh, again, surprises me constantly the fact that the dollar gets off the mat. We'll see. Here we are, sort of this 92 and a half, 93 level. What are your thoughts? You drew this little uptrend line. Um, there's that obviously that significant downtrend line that we broke a while ago thoughts on the dollar here Dave? yeah this 93 and a half 94 level and chris vecchio is going to take a look at this for us he's he's got a better eye on this stuff than we do and this is just an input that i like to use here i mean obviously there's a bit of technical resistance here really nice bounce off that 88 uh, 89 and a half 90 level i know that there's a lot of people calling for um a breakdown there it held if you look at that downtrend from last year's highs though you can get all the way back to 90 in a pullback and it would still be above support there and so to me i'm just not sure it breaks there and it's you know so let's get chris's takes on some other crosses um when we get there but i'll just say this if the fed were to start to taper and if expectations for rate hikes were to increase i don't really see the dollar going down and if the dollar goes up you tell me what's going to happen to some of these commodity prices that have been very volatile of late, guy. Well, it's like that Taylor Swift song, Wrecking Ball, that I know you're a big fan <laughs> of. I bought her DVD as well. That, you know, a rising dollar <laughs> is a wrecking ball for so many things, not least of which commodities. We'll see if that takes place. By the way, you've been spot on in the commodities, which is why the next chart we have to look at is crude oil, which, you know, we're going to look at a longer term chart, which really tells the story. But this one, Dan, stop to the penny, as Carter Worth would say, to the penny. 
effectively on the 200 day moving average. And now we're bouncing. The question is, does that 71 level or so come into play? Whether it be the 50 day and then subsequently, are we going to take out this long trend, this long term trend line that we will show you next? Yeah, I think crude really is probably a function of how China reopens here, how Europe is doing um, with the Delta, how quickly we come out of it. I mean, I think crude, you know, it didn't overshot like a lot of these other industrial commodities. The breakout that we saw in June seemed pretty orderly. The decline has been very orderly other than a couple really sharp um, down days. But like you said, it stopped where it was supposed to. We have this long term chart of crude guy and you and I've talked about it on the like a boss, like a boss. And if you look at that on a log basis i mean where it got to just recently i mean that was at that long-term downtrend and you know at the time i was like listen you have to respect those lines i mean it's just that simple now you can draw some other lines on a shorter term basis and show a bit of a breakout but right now we kind of know where resistance is let's see how it goes let's see how crude acts in the face of some of this data and and it really will show i think um just the confidence that global investors have in the pace of the recovery and how linear it might be. But if we have fits and starts and we retest um, yesterday's lows, you go through 60, that's a broken chart. Yeah, I agree. Look, in this chart, we look at a much more dramatic, in my opinion, if you're able to back out that April 20th minus $40 yeah. print. Um, but obviously we can't do it. But I think you understand what I'm saying. And some of you aren't armchair technicians know as well. To Dan's point, we stop spot on the line. And if in fact we do break, that 60 level sort of, I don't know who Katie is. We mention it all the time, but you got to bar the door. But I think this is a pretty dramatic chart to show you how interesting and, and how, all, you know, to the point, I mean, this has been a 13 year downtrend in crude that we traded up to and seemingly failed. We'll see what happens. The next story that has to tell is the XLE though. And again, traded down past resistance in the form of the January high becomes support. We started at 45 bouncing now this short-term downtrend line that Dan drew is in play. If crude were to rally, my sense is this thing is going to be sort of um, spring loaded to the upside and that 55 levels in play. Yeah, I mean, that re that resistance looks pretty clear. I mean, the equities, this is XLE and 45% of the weight of this ETF is Chevron and Exxon. And they started leading well before crude topped out here to the downside. So I think that's a this is an interesting one to watch. You see a break of that 45, watch out. Crude's going below 60, in my opinion. That's what it's um, saying to me. Is that a tradable bounce? Maybe. I mean, did you have the guts to get in there and do it Friday afternoon when it looked like it was going to break? I don't know. I would not have. Um, there's nothing that I see there. Um, you know, retaking that 200-day moving average is important. I would just say that the range is getting narrower and narrower, and it will likely break one way or the other. So um, keep an eye on some of this data here uh, moving forward. And, and, and listen, don't think for a second, Guy. Again, we just mentioned like some of the transports. Let's see how they act, too, because they might be a good tell in this trade. Without question, I'm glad you mentioned transports earlier. And, and again, with the IYT, obviously, to the extent you can look at that, but the individual names, the FedExes and some of the rails, UPS obviously come into play, airlines, keep those on your radar screen as well. The next chart we have to look at is dollar. This is a dollar in the crude, basically. So you can see some of the correlations we've seen. Again, yeah. you got to back out that April 2020 low, but I think it's pretty clear as to, you know, when the dollar moves, what subsequently happens in crude. And you actually brought this up months ago, Dan, in terms of what you thought was going to happen. Yeah, listen, at the end of 2013, the Fed started to taper or they announced the taper and they were doing, I think at the time, $85 billion um, a month and they were tapering 10 billion. And the dollar started to rally when they started doing that. Expectations for rate hikes started um, to go higher. Rate hikes started in 2015. And you saw that move in the Dixie, the US dollar index. It was massive, you know, 80 to 100. And what happened to crude oil over the next year or two? It went down like six. 65% or so. And that chart, I think, speaks a lot to me um, about that. So just keep an eye on that relationship. I think that's important. All right, guy, Jay Pegapalooza. These yeah, are, I mean, these again, are, please these help are, me here. Help yeah, me. We're going to be really quick here. These are digital images. Um, they are going berserk. Visa yesterday um, announced that they bought a crypto punk for $150,000, one of the cheapest ones. There was 10000 minted in the like hour or two after that announcement. Um, I think like 
like 90 traded for a total of $20 million. Why do I bring this up? Well, you look at this Bitcoin chart. Bitcoin went from 28,500 to nearly 50,000 in a straight line. And what happens when people do that? Or when, when, when you see a move in crypto, people start figuring out things to buy with crypto that give them status or mm -hmm. whatever you want. And I just think that what's interesting to me about this whole thing is that these people truly believe this. They believe in what they're doing, buying board apes, buying rocks, um, digital rocks for hundreds of thousands of dollars or crypto punks and all the power to them, okay? Um, but it really speaks to the sort of speculation that we're seeing in different pockets of risk assets. And that's why I bring that up. And then just looking at that Bitcoin chart, you see it's above the 200 day moving average. You see the steepness of that uptrend over the last month and a half or so. Um, is 50,000 a key psychological level? Maybe, I don't think there's any knock on effects to any other uh, at risk assets like, like equities, but maybe to gold. No, and we talked to, we had Tom Lee, we spoke to him about this. And a few weeks ago, he said, you actually buy Bitcoin through the 200 day moving average. We yeah. talked about how that's somewhat counterintuitive, but he expected this and he's getting it in spades. And obviously today it was announced micro strategies. I want to say they bought another 3000 or so Bitcoins. I think the average price was around 45,000. Uh, they continue to add to their war chest in terms yeah. of where it is on their balance sheet. It's really interesting. We'll see. You know, does that 50,000 level prove to be short term resistance? Who knows? There are a lot of people out there that think by the end of this mm -hmm. year, and again, we're at the end of August, you're going to see 100,000 in Bitcoin. Who knows? I don't understand JPEGs. I've never been to a Lollapalooza or any type of Palooza, but I'm also 57, soon to be 58, by the way. But somebody who's not 57 or 58 is the great Chris Vecchio, senior strategist at Daily FX. Chris, You've heard us waxing poetic. A few thoughts before we look at your charts. Uh, well, first thought is that uh, Wrecking Ball is by Miley Cyrus. Not yeah, I, I, <laughs> it's I, not a 1970s movie that. reference. So, uh, <laughs> uh, well, yeah, you know, guys, there's a lot of things that are going on right now, and you know, I think there's been a really big tell. The fact that the Jackson Hole Economic Policy Symposium has moved to a virtual event. You know, th that the Fed is no longer meeting in person. That you guys are no longer recording in the CNBC studios at the NASDAQ, that to me says that there's a lot of Delta variant concern continuing to be built in this market, but we have vaccines now. And for most part, the economy has adjusted to this new hybrid digital world where most people are working from home. So, you know, if you're really concerned about inflation still, stocks remain a place to be. Mm -hmm. Stocks and real estate historically are the best two hedges against inflation in the post-World War II era. And that likely remains the case here. You know, when we're talking about what's going on in the FX world, in, in various asset allocation and churning, I'm really curious if we could just pull up our next chart here, because we're seeing something occur that suggests ever so slightly that the market is understanding the difference between tapering and tightening once more, right? Tapering is like if you're going down the highway at 100 miles per hour and you start going, say, 50 miles per hour. You're still making forward progress, just not at the same pace. Tapering is not withdrawing stimulus, it's just adding a little bit less. And so what mm -hmm. we've seen here is this orange line on the chart here, those Fed rate hike odds through the end of 2023, those have been more or less unchanged for the last six months, pricing in about three, three and a half rate hikes for the better part of this year. Whereas the bond market, the 2S, 5S, 10S, that butterfly, that has actually increased consistent with the behavior that we saw in 2013, 2014. So the market is wrapping its head around this notion after the July FOMC minutes, that we're going to see tapering, not necessarily tightening. And this news that Jacksonville is going to a virtual event very much feels like this taper announcement will be delayed. Yeah, I agree with you. And that's the point we made on Fast Money last night. And we talked about that earlier. I happen to agree with it. I think that that, that announcement of a virtual uh, Jackson Hole gives them tremendous air cover. And I think it's manifesting itself in some of the things you just said. Obviously, what does that all lead to? Well, something you and I both, well, I love it more than you probably do, but gold, obviously. Finally, getting it's interesting that gold actually caught a bit of a rally on the back of Bitcoin catching rally as well. I can't make heads or tails of this. I'm zigging when I should be zagging, and that's been a problem with me now for years. What are your thoughts here on gold? Well, you know, gold prices had a really significant breakdown a few weeks ago when we had that large uh, sell order come through at the start of the open at second week of August. But finding support on those lows that we had back in uh, March and early April it seems like a big low has been established. Importantly, we've retaken that trend line from the May 2019, March 20, and March 21 lows 
And now we're back in the symmetrical triangle that's governed price action for this year. So a false breakdown, a false bearish breakout, if you will. We're now aiming towards the 1835 level. Price was capped there throughout the month of July. And if we break through there after Jackson Hole, because the Fed is not signaling uh, an imminent taper, if you will, mm -hmm. this could be a quick trip back up to the high 1800s. Happen to agree with you, Dan. I know you, you were a big gold bug back in the day. I, I was not. I am not. Um, you know, again, I think it's been a good trading vehicle. Chris drew some, drew some really good lines. Um, you know, I guess it really does come back to Bitcoin. I do believe, um, you know, I'm not like one of these Bitcoin maximalists or anything like that. But I think that there's a community out there that has willed this into existence. These are not people that traditionally would have bought gold. And I do think that Bitcoin, as it appreciates in price, it will be taking market share um, from gold. So, uh, you know, to me, I think, Guy, you made the best point here is that it caught a bit on the back of Bitcoin. Let's see what happens if Bitcoin um, comes in a little bit. It, maybe back towards 40,000 in the next uh, you know few weeks or, or months or something and see how gold acts. I just don't see a scenario where gold is going to get back to where it was um, back in August of 2020. I know that Chris is not calling for that. Maybe you know to that downtrend that he drew would be a nice um, reflex move here. But to me, I just think there's probably better, better risk assets to trade right now. Yeah. And before we go to the euro, Chris, you know, you mentioned that big, it was a Sunday night actually where gold sort of had that, I mean, I don't want to say flash crash, but it had a huge move to the down downside in periods where it's typically not that liquid and you know i've heard people say it was sort of a junior trader and i pushed back and said actually i happen to think it's probably somebody that's extraordinarily sophisticated probably understood that a move of that magnitude in gold might actually trigger some buying in bitcoin and whether you know i'm imagining it or not that's pretty much what happened we'll see now if gold can continue this rise off of that sort of flash crash low but let's take a look at the euro chart chris because now, this is another one that seems to have seems to have found support thoughts here. Absolutely. You know, the euro itself, uh, so much as it's an inverse reflection of what's going on with the dollar index. It's the largest component of the DXY at 57.6%. The dollar index looks like it made a false move higher through that early March 2021 high, setting a new yearly high last week before quickly getting sucked back into uh, the triangle that's been in place throughout August and, and July. And as a result, the euro, while breaking below 117 ever so briefly, below that cluster of Fibonacci retracements, it's now trading higher. Uh, the tell for me is going to be if it can make a move to that daily 21 EMA. I like the 21 EMA more than, say, the simple SMA, the 20, because there are 20.7 trading days in a month. And I like uh, my moving averages to have a time decay function built in rather than just equal weights. And so if we can move above that one month average, if you will, which we're very close to doing so today, it may be a sign that we're looking at a more significant euro dollar move higher in the very near term. But it's hard to think that the euro is going to be moving much higher consistently. If we take a look, you know, we don't have the chart here, but if you were to go home and take a look at your inflation differential for the eurozone in the U.S. and you were to say push those out six months into the future, there's a very strong correlation that as U.S. inflation outstrips eurozone inflation, euro dollar tends to weaken. And we're very much in that place right now. So if we do see significant euro dollar gains here back up to 118 or so, I think it does provide a selling opportunity ultimately. That doesn't necessarily mean that the dollar is going to continue to move up. It just could mean that we're in for a period of extended sideways chop here for the greenback. Some call it sterling. Some call it cable. You call it pound. Here we are again, similar again, found support uh, thoughts here. Cause I happen to think we're going to take this next leg higher. I, I do too. It looks like that we had a bit of a false break down again, once more here in the pound and we're seeing a little bit of, clues start to accumulate on the daily time frame. In fact, it was just at the end of last week into the beginning of this one that we established that nice three candle pattern, the Morningstar cluster, which suggests that there is a near term bottom that has been established. And if we're able to climb through that descending trend line uh, from the May from the July swing highs, that gives credence for another gain back up into that 142 area or so. You know, the Delta variant concerns as they've accumulated here in the US, we've actually seen that measures of excess mortality in places like the UK and Israel and Canada, they haven't accelerated. So the vaccines are working. All this concern that the UK may have opened up too early with Freedom Day, I honestly think they're misplaced. Dan, do you see something similar? 
Yeah, you know, it's funny. I think that expectations for just every, you know, the global reflation trade in general, you know, have just been off. And I think that this is something that I think we have to remember that once we get by Delta and we just, you know, listen, I was walking up into Central Park with tens of thousands of other people Saturday night to go to the reopening concert, right, for New York City. Well, it got canceled. Now, it didn't get canceled midway. It got canceled in COVID times. You know, there was lightning or something like that. But there was a lot of people, I'm sure, we're thinking, oh my goodness, is this a good idea? And I think that once we get by Delta, there's going to be another thing or whatever. You know, we're going to be living with this for a while. So I think the fits and starts, Chris, that you mentioned earlier about um, some of the headwinds that we're going to have to this coordinated reflation are going to be around for a while here. So, um, you know, is it a good trading environment? Yes. Um, uh, you know, to me, I think that you probably have that good support here. You do have that broken uptrend. Um, to me, um, um, you know, I, I think that you have to go with your lines there. Ralph Macchio, I happen to think his greatest role um, was in The Outsiders. A lot of people liked the movie uh, when he was like, when, when he karate was a kid, kid that did yeah. karate. Yeah. Right. And I mentioned that because what was that? Wax on, wax off. Well, dollar yen is risk on, risk off. See what I did there, Chris? And here we are. I can't make heads or tails of this one uh, moving sideways now. What are your thoughts here? Because this really, I don't see much here in terms of the chart. Maybe you do. You know, there's been a lot of false starts here in, in dollar yen. We had that rising bearish wedge that encompassed most of the price action for this year. We fell out of the wedge. We moved back into a, a shorter term bullish falling wedge. You know, there's a case to be made that maybe there's an inverse head and shoulders forming over the last few weeks. Uh, but the fact of the matter is that if we do see delta variant concerns accelerate, you know, that's bad for dollar yen, perhaps Good for equities, though, because that means we're going to have more Fed stimulus, more easing, uh, more fiscal support coming down the pipeline. So the way that I'm approaching this, uh, I think actually looking at this from a call spread perspective, you know, selling those out of the money calls higher, uh, buying them lower. That's really where my mindset is, because I think we're going to see that sideways grind. We're not necessarily going to break down below 109 or 108, but we're not going to come back to 112, uh, you know, 111, 112 anytime soon. Sideways movement here looks like the modus operandi until we get a push. And quite frankly, U.S. yields aren't looking like they're going to be going anywhere anytime soon that the Fed is using the, the virtual summit this week as air cover to say that they need to delay their taper timeline. I want to give a big shout out to Ralph Macho. happens to be a macro setup fan. So Ralph, if you're watching, come on, join us one of these days. I also want to thank Chris Vecchio. You are the man. Dan, any parting thoughts before we get on out of here? Yeah, I think it's important. We're seeing this melt up in equities right now. And Chris gave us a lot of great reasons why that's happening. It just seems like the Delta and a whole host of other things are giving the Fed a little cover um, to push out maybe the taper. I'm not so certain that's going to be um, the case as we turn the page and get to September here. Guy did tell it is Virgo land right now here, buddy. But I'll just remind everybody um, this time last year, we were melting up. A lot of people were very complacent. We had a 10% um, decline. And what felt like a straight line here. Obviously, we did recover, but I think a little fear back into these equity markets would be a healthy thing, especially as we think about how to position post-Delta. Before we thank our sponsors, uh, I want to mention, a turn the page, a great song by one of the most underrated artists, maybe in my lifetime, the great Bob Seger. Uh, there you go. I want to thank Chris Vecchio. <laughs> Chris does a tremendous job. I want to thank our presenting sponsors, Dan, Nate, get please get ready. I'm Nadex, ready, buddy. the leading U.S. exchange for binary options, call spreads, and knockouts. Knockouts is correct, and of course, Open Exchange. They manage virtual meetings that matter for the top companies around the world. Chris Vecchio, thank you. Dan Nathan, thank you. Thank you, our audience, and we'll see you next week, where I think it's going to be September. Adios.